Amen. So uh, tonight, what I thought I'd do is I, I want to teach out of Deuteronomy. And what has been on my heart, um, maybe because my wife and I are homeschooling our grandson, and, um, and I'm teaching him the Bible. And it's, it's so interesting to see his perspective of things and what he knows and what verses he reads that he doesn't understand that are so simple to me. Um, but then what, what he gets out of these different verses is just, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and so I wanted to read out of Deuteronomy. Now, um, the, one of the reasons for doing this really is because we all as Christians need to be reading the Bible regularly and letting it speak to us. And the Old Testament has so many great things in the, in the law of Moses, in Torah. There are so many great lessons. And, you know, Torah, the word Torah does not mean law. It gets translated law all the time, but it doesn't actually mean law. It means instruction. Uh, by the way, and you, you guys know what a bat mitzvah is and a bar mitzvah. You know, in a bar mitzvah, a, a Jewish boy at 13 years old becomes a son of the law, bar mitzvah. And mitzvah is the actual word for law. Torah is the word for instruction. And so what Torah does is it lays down examples. I mean, you guys have all seen attorneys' offices. They got gazillions of books. If God were to write a law on everything, nobody would ever read the Bible. <laughs> It'd be a million volumes. So what he does is he lays down instruction that helps us understand how to live. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And if we're going to be an imitator of God, and if we're going to be an imitator of Christ, which Paul said to uh, his disciples, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. So if we're going to be imitators of God and imitators of Christ, we've got to know how they think, what makes sense to them versus what our natural mind might think. And so let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. And I just want to spend some time in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and Deuteronomy chapter 23, reading through these laws with you and reflecting on how to think like God thinks and how to stop thinking like modern people mostly think. So starting out in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 1, you must not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. You must surely take them back to your brother. Now, in that culture, if you had an ox or a sheep, it would be hard in some cases to keep it without being discovered. But, but you don't have to take it back to them. You could just watch it wander off and go, ha, ha. you know, he's going to go all over looking for that. But one thing the, uh, the Bible is clear about is if you find something that isn't yours, it isn't yours. <laughs> this finders, keepers, we, losers, weepers stuff is straight from the devil. You know, if it's not yours, it's not yours. And the Bible is going to say, make some kind of effort to return it. So it says, you must surely take them back to your brother. In verse two, it says, well, if your brother's not near to you, or if you don't know him, you know, some, some animals wandering by and you don't have a clue whose it is, then you bring it into the midst of your house. Now, when it says this, you have to understand the culture. You, you might, if, if you didn't have, if your house wasn't full of animals, you might actually bring it into your house for protection, or the word house can mean household. And most families lived in compounds. They lived very close together. So you could bring it into the midst of your family compound and everybody could watch out for it and help out and with, with keeping it. It says you're to bring it into the midst of your house and it is to be with you until your brother looks for it. And then you can restore it to him. It doesn't say you keep it for a couple months and then it's a sheep, so eat it. <laughs> you keep it. And, and this is about 
extending ourselves for others. Is this convenient? No. It's, you know, you look outside, there's a strange dog in your yard, you go out, it looks like it's hungry, it doesn't have a license, it doesn't have a collar, it's kind of scruffy, it's like, wow, what am I going to do with this? You know, is it convenient? No, it would be convenient if it never showed up. But it's, it's inconvenient. But, but, you know, when, when all these prophecies and these manifestations about, you know, being children of God, walking in the light, shining in the light, that's what Christians do. We inconvenience ourselves for others. And then verse three, you must do this with his donkey. You must do this with his clothing. You know, we just had guests over the weekend and they left something. So now we're figuring out how do we get this back to them? You must do this with his clothing. You must do this with every lost thing of your brothers that he has lost and you have found. You are not to hide yourself from them and you're certainly not to keep them. So this is the way Christians are supposed to think. And this is one of the reasons why it's so good that you and I read you know, these things in the Bible so we can we can remember clearly how to think like God thinks. By the way, uh, this is also, um, if you want to look at Exodus 23, verse 4, real quick, um, the, this is a kind of an interesting uh, juxtaposition. Exodus 23, 4, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you must surely bring it back to him again. So Exodus 20, Exodus, the book of Exodus was written in the, like the second and third month after the Exodus. 40 years later, Deuteronomy is written in the 11th month of the 40th year. At the end of the 11th month, Moses is going to die. They will mourn for him for 30 days for the 12th month of the 40th year. And then in the first month of the 41st year, Joshua takes the Israelites across the Jordan. So these were laws in Deuteronomy that were written for the generation that had, that had uh, risen up. And they're slightly different than the laws in Exodus, uh, because now God's thinking about the fact that people are going to settle down. Um, they're going to go into the promised land. They're not going to be living in tents for 40 years. They're going to go into the promised land. They're going to settle down. They're going to build houses. They're going to be in family units. They're going to be in tribal units. And so the laws shift a little bit. Um, then verse four, uh, you must not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the road and hide yourself from them. You are to lift, yes, lift it up together with him. And God repeats the word lift here in the text. So the word, the verb lift occurs twice. Um, in different cases, uh, one's generally an infinitive, um, and I forget the other one, but in any case, you get lift, lift, the verb occurs twice, but it's in, in different cases. And this, this also occurs, if you're still in Exodus 23, or you can get back quick enough, uh, look at Exodus uh, 23, verse 5. Very, very similar to what we're reading here in Deuteronomy. If you see the donkey of one who hates you falling down under his burden, do not leave him. You must surely help him with this, with it. And again, this isn't convenient. And one of the things we've got to see here, okay, God, what are you asking us to do? You're asking us to think of our fellow man as better than we are or equal with us. And, and we're, to, we're to inconvenience ourselves to help people. And that's part of how we make our light shine. This is part of the reason why Israel was supposed to be attractive to the pagans who could then join into the ranks of Israel. Um, uh, Deuteronomy 22.5, there is not to be a man's things upon a woman, nor is a man to put on a woman's clothing. Forever, uh, for whoever does these things, is an abomination to Yahweh your God. Because in Genesis 5, God created them male and female. And the stability and the safety and the, and the future of the society was a strong family. 
And so God wanted people to do things that would contribute to the strength of the family unit. And that means there has to be a husband, there has to be a wife, they're going to get married, they're going to have sex, they're going to produce children, those children are going to continue the society. And so God speaks in the scripture quite a bit about things that would attack the family unit. And this is one of them. Now we go to verse six. And again, what we're going to see in verse six is the kindness of God, the holiness of God, the reason that the people of God should stand head and shoulders above the pagans around them and be attractive to men and women in those pagan societies who are frankly tired of the cruelty of the pagan world. And so in verse six, it says, if you happen to come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground as you travel on the road, and it has young ones or eggs, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, you must not take the mother with the young. It goes on, verse seven, you must, and it doubles the word here, you must set free, set free the mother. And that's not a typo. The Hebrew text actually takes the same word, the exact same word, and doubles it for emphasis. Because why would, why would God do that? Because the natural tendency, people are always hungry. People always want food. Wow, I get a bird and the babies. That, how cool is that? God says, no, set free, set free the mother. Why? Because what we know about birds today is most of the time, if the mother is released, you know, um, animals don't mourn like people do. And so most of the time, that the if if you let the mother go it may flutter around for a day or so but eventually it'll simply let go and if it's early enough in the season it will build a new nest and lay new eggs and the generations of birds will continue so he says verse seven you must set free set free the mother but the young you may take to yourself and of course then you'd eat those I do this so that it will be well with you and that you may prolong your days. And if the animals are doing well, that helps prolong uh, the, the, the whole uh, system, the whole ecosystem that God has set up. Plus, you prolong your days because you are kind. And, and kind and loving people you know, are, are not as anxious. They're not as worried. They're, they don't get as upset. They don't have some of the health problems that worry warts do. And so you prolong your days. Now, verse eight. Now, God didn't say anything about this in Exodus because in Exodus, everybody's living in a tent. <laughs> but here, the people are going to build houses in the promised land, and those houses are going to have flat roofs. And so he says in verse eight, when you build a new house, then you are to make a railing from your roof so that you do not bring blood guilt on your house if anyone falls from there. And this is a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting commandment because it again shows us the value of Torah, because this is an instruction. Why are you building a railing so someone won't get hurt? Why do we use ground fault interrupter circuits in our bathrooms so nobody gets electrocuted? It's our responsibility, and, and there's a balance here, obviously, but it's our responsibility to put things in place so that people are safe until we're safe. Um, and so this is one example of a building code. So people that say, oh, you know, I ought to be able to do anything I want with my property. God doesn't think so. God thinks it's our responsibility to make our property safe. And had the robber barons of the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, thought about this, their factories would have been a lot safer. One of the, the real shames of the early American Industrial Revolution is that so many of the factories and so many of the jobs were so unsafe. And granted, there can be regulations that overdo things, but it is the responsibility that we have to make sure people are safe. And then uh, verse nine, you are not to sow your vineyard with two kinds of seeds or the entire yield will be forfeited as holy, 
both the seed that you have sown and the increase of the vineyard. And God here uh, created the different species and genuses. And what he's saying is don't mess with that. Don't sit there and poke around and try to crossbreed. And today that, you know, people playing God and we're going to do a better job than God did with all of his creation. And we, we, we've gone way beyond just crossbreeding. Now we're doing all kinds of gene splicing and all kinds of things that we shouldn't be doing. But God says, look, if you just leave my creation alone, it's the best it's going to be. If you mess with it, it's not going to get any better. Uh, verse 10, do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Um, this is not only about kind of maintaining God's order of things. It's also about kindness, because typically uh, in the biblical world, the donkey would be taller than the ox and the ox would pull harder than the donkey. And the result would be that the yoke would hurt both animals. Um, where if you have two animals that are, that are equally yoked, and of course you're familiar with that term, even from Corinthians, you know, do not be unequally yoked. Why? Because it hurts both parties. And so here, God just says, look, it's, it's not, you know, beyond the fact that, you know, he's trying to project an, an image of, of holiness and respecting his creation. It's simply not kind to your animal to, to plow with an oxen and a, a, a donkey together. And there's a verse in Proverbs about how a good man is kind to his animals. Verse 11, do not wear a mixed cloth, wool and linen together. I've never been able to find any, uh, any kind of writing on this is why that would be other than it just simply God is saying, look, I've got a created order of things and I'd like that to be maintained. Um, verse 12, you are to make yourselves tassels on the four corners of your cloak with which to cover yourselves. Now, your cloak obviously doesn't have four corners. <laughs> you know, it's usually just this round thing that goes around your body, your outer garment. Uh, and so what he's talking about, your left front, your right front, your left back, your right front, your right back. And those would be the four corners, corners. And you're supposed to put tassels on those corners. So this is really uh, expounded more in Numbers chapter 15. So let's go there. Um, Numbers chapter 15. And we're going to uh, verse 37. And it says, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and tell them they are to make themselves tassels on the borders of their garment throughout their generations. And that's important. These tassels were supposed to be on the, the outer garment of the Jewish people uh, through their generations and that they put on the tassel of each border a cord of blue. And if you've ever seen the Jewish prayer shawls, the prayer shawls have Indian tassels. They're white tassels, but they have a cord of blue in them. Where that comes from is what between the revolt of the Roman revolt of 70 AD and the Bar Kokhba revolt of 135 AD, the Romans had had quite enough with the Jews. They were just fed up with the Jews. They were over the Jews, done with them. And so they forbid a lot of the outward practice of Judaism. For a while, they tried to forbid circumcision, for example, but they also forbid the wearing of tassels, which told everybody that's a Jew. And so uh, in the tassel is called the seat seat uh, in the Hebrew text. And the seat seat were forbidden. So what the Jews did was they took the tassels off of their robes. They took the four tassels off of their robes. They put the tassels on a shawl and wore it underneath their clothes so that it couldn't be seen. So they got to wear the tassels, but they couldn't be outwardly seen in the Roman world at that time. The amazing thing to me is that when the laws were relaxed and the Jews could go back to wearing the tassels, they never did, uh, but they should have. And so today 
the Jewish outerwear doesn't have tassels, but the prayer shawls, shawls still do. So in Numbers chapter uh, 15, verse 37, they are to make themselves tassels on their garments and that they put a tassel on each border, a cord of blue. And it will be to you for a tassel that you can see and then remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them so that you do not seek after your own heart and your own eyes in order that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. And so here are tassels that people had on their garment and the idea was they were going to use that tassel to remember God. And a lot of people today will do something similar. They will wear, um, they will wear a cross. I wear an anchor uh, underneath my shirt. Um, and that anchor uh, reminds me of the hope. And there's a number of times often when, you know, if I'm particularly upset by a news story or something like that and the world seems to be going down the tubes in a handbasket then I can reach in and, and I just hold my anchor and thank God for the hope <laughs> you know be faithful now you know the short affliction you know there's a, a, a greater weight in glory that kind of thing and so this this anchor helps me if you have a cross or something it may help you the Jews had their tassels so that they would see them on themselves and on each other and remember the law. And the rest of chapter 22 is all about sexual sin, and I really don't want to get derailed on that. Um, so what I'd like to do is go right to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Um, it's, not, it's not a bad thing to read all the, the laws about sexual practices, because sexual purity can be hard to come by in today's world. And it's good to know, you know, what God is commanding about it. Um, but it's just that it's, it's many, many verses and the explanations get pretty involved. And so um, I thought for this particular teaching, we'd simply move on uh, with, uh, with Deuteronomy chapter 23. So in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse one, it says, he who has his testicles crushed or his male organ cut off, you know, his penis cut off, may not enter into the assembly of Yahweh. Now, what does that mean? First of all, what's the assembly of Yahweh? In the Old Testament times, the assembly of Yahweh were the men of Israel who were accepted as full Jewish members of the Jewish community, and thus they could vote in matters that came up before any town or any group of elders or any issue. If you remember in Numbers chapter 11, well, let's just go there. Let's just go to Numbers chapter 11. Because this is a good example, because some people say, well, you know, they didn't vote in the Bible, so I'm not going to vote. They absolutely voted in the Bible. They voted in the Old Testament, and they voted in the New Testament. So what's happening in Numbers chapter 11 is the people are complaining and Moses in verse 10 hears the people weeping and he goes to God and he says, what? Did I father all these people? You've got to be kidding me. And, and uh, so he says, you know, if you help me out or kill me now, basically, verse 15. So we go to verse 16. So Yahweh says to Moses, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel who you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. So notice that God didn't say, okay, Moses, here's a list of 70 names. He said, Moses, you go out and find 70 people. And then Moses would go and ask the people that were close to him. And they would ask the people that were close to them. And where are we going to find 70 people who are qualified to do this? And those, basically, those 70 people were elected, if you will. Same thing with the seven men who helped with the distribution of goods, among whom C Stephen was one of them in Acts chapter 6. So you have, because the apostles didn't say, we're going to choose seven men. They looked at the congregation and they said, you find seven men. Well, now, think about how many people were nominated in Acts chapter 6. They're supposed to find seven men. They've got thousands of people. 
How many people do you think wanted to be one of those seven men? There would have been a lot of them. So they had to have a system. But note that it was the people that brought the seven forward, not the apostles. And so there was, it, and so it's, you know, we don't really think of them have, as having free elections, but in many cases, they voted for or threw their lot in for who would be over them. And this becomes important because here this verse says, if a man's had his testicles crushed or his penis cut off, he can't be a voting member. And why is that? Because a voting member has to care about the future more than themselves especially me at my age, I'm much more concerned about the world for Sam, Sierra, Carly, and their children, my grandchildren, more than I am about me, you know, for Pete's sake. I, you know, and frankly, people have no business voting if all they're concerned about is them. You know, you've got to be concerned. God is, think how concerned God is about the future generation. That's why the family is the center of God's society, not the government ruling over the family. The family is the center of God's society. And you can't vote if you don't, if, if you are in a position where you might not care about the future. And then verse two, a son born from a forbidden union is not to enter the assembly of Yahweh, even tend to the 10th generation. No one descended from him is to enter the assembly of Yahweh. And again, why is that? What's a forbidden union? A forbidden union would be something like incest, something like that. There are various forbidden unions in the law. But the person from a, a forbidden union is much more likely to be liberal and to say, oh, those laws of God are too strict. You know, those laws of God don't, they aren't really loving. They aren't really inclusive. You know, look at me. You know, I was a child of incest and I'm doing okay. And, and on and on it goes. And God says, look, we, we don't want that infighting in the assembly. You know, voting is fine. You want to vote, you be an Israelite. Now we're going to see later, he's going to modify that slightly, but, but we'll hang on to that. Then he says, verse three, an Ammonite or a Moabite is not to enter the assembly of Yahweh even to the 10th generation, which here is a, a kind of a figure forever, which we'll see by the end of the verse, none belonging to them is to enter the assembly of Yahweh forever. Why? We're going to go on and get God's explanation, but well, we'll just read it. Verse four. Now, why? Because they did not meet you on the road with bread and with water when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Baor from Pathor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. And you guys remember that in Numbers, the story of the talking donkey and Balaam, and he was hired by the Moabites to curse Israel, but then God put a word in his mouth that was a blessing, and Balak, the king of Moab, got all upset about it. That's in Numbers chapter 32. Verse 5, but Yahweh your God would not listen to Balaam, and Yahweh your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because you, because Yahweh your God loves you. Verse six, you are not to seek their peace or their prosperity all your days for the ages, which doesn't mean you're supposed to go to war with them. It means you're not supposed to let them in to your congregation so that they can vote and be among you like you are. So now, again, what's going on there? You know that uh, the feuds, the blood feuds in the, middle, in the Middle East go on sometimes generation after generation after generation. Memories, historic memories in the Middle East are very long. Here's the Apostle Paul, and, and he's writing in, in the epistle to the Philippians, you know, that I'm a Benjamite. Um, you know, and you got to be kidding me, Benjamin? You know, Benjamin was like 1,500 years before and yet his family remembered for 1,500 years. Now, remember, you're descended from Benjamin, you know, <laughs> Ben Yamin, son of my right hand, you know, the great blessing of, of, of Jacob, you know. And so these historic memories are long. And because of that, if you let a Moabite or an Ammonite into your voting membership, even if they have a facade of, oh, I love Israel and I care about Israel, you know, some of those ancient 
uh, memories may come back and they may end up stabbing you in, in the back. So God says, you know, don't let them into your congregation. But then verse, look at verse seven. This is different. You are not to abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Because remember, you have Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau were, were brothers. And the Edomites didn't treat Israel badly when they came out of Egypt. You are not to abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. And by the way, you're not to abhor an Egyptian. Really? Why? Well, you lived as a foreigner in his land. You know what it's like. So then verse 8 says, the sons of the third generation who are born to them may enter into the assembly of, of the Lord. So the first generation Edomite can't, the second generation Edomite can't, but the third generation of Edomite can become a, a Jew. He can become a proselyte and become a Jew. Let's go to Exodus, please. Chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And this is one of the reasons, by the way, that we need to be reading the whole law, because so much of the law is kind of scattered. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, when I'm particularly frustrated, I complain to God and say, couldn't you have like taken all of the things on one subject and put it in one place? You know, <laughs> how come it gets to be so scattered everywhere? But Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, a very, very important verse for where we're going with this, um, says, there it is, when a foreigner resides with you, and wants to keep the Passover to Yahweh, all his males must be circumcised, and then he may come near and keep it, and he will be like one who is born in the land. But no uncircumcised person is to eat of it. So these Egyptians and the Edomites in the third generation, they would get circumcised, they would be able to eat the Passover, they would be able to vote in the assembly of the Jews, they would be, they would literally be pulled in to the Jewish nation. And I think, you know, that shows God's heart. This is a very delicate section in the sense that it's tough to exclude some people and include others. But bottom line is that's the way life works. Some people are safe and some people aren't. And it's valuable when thinking about heck, having a family, who you invite over to your house, running a business, and who you hire, and who you don't hire, and, and that kind of thing. I mean, some people are just thorns in the flesh, and they're better off being excluded. And some people, even though they may not be, you know, from your background, that, you know, you give them a little time, and they, they just, they become like, like, like one of you. You know, and it, this is this so this is one of the things that is really interesting about this section of scripture. And we see God's uh, inclusiveness and how he wanted people to join Israel. You know, the whole point about making Israel shine and giving them these laws of, laws of holiness was so that pagans that were living in a cruel pagan world where there was human sacrifice and terrible cruelty could say, you know, I, I, I'm looking at the Jews over there, and they're, they're peaceful, they're happy, they've got great laws. I'm going to go over there and knock on their door and see what it takes to be one. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's how, it, and it kind of in history, that's sort of how it happened. The verse, uh, verse 9, now this is uh, going into ritual uncleanness, but I, I just love what's, uh, what's going on here. Um, God says, when you are encamped against your enemies, now this is very important to catch this, because this is not living in Israel. This is not talking about life in Israel with your family in your house. This is now you're out to war and you're in an army camp. And he says, when you are encamped against your enemies, then you are to keep yourselves from every evil thing. And so now it's going to mention a couple evil things that people in an army camp could get involved you with. Verse 10, if there's, any, if there's among you any man who's not ritually cleaned because of what happens to him at night, and we call that a nocturnal emission of semen, then he must go outside the camp. He must not come inside the camp. But as sunset comes near, he must bathe himself in water, and when the sun is down, he may come inside the camp. And this is, um, so basically what God's doing here is he's extending the law for men and women being unclean 
uh, by virtue of the issue of semen uh, from Leviticus. So let's go Leviticus 15. Because Leviticus 15 is going to be um, different than this. That was in an army camp. But Leviticus chapter 15 is going to uh, have the same kind of message slightly differently. So Leviticus uh, 16, 15 verse 16, if any man has an emission of semen, then he is to bathe all his flesh in water and be unclean until evening, until the evening. Verse 17, every garment and every skin on which the semen is must be washed with water and be unclean until evening. Verse 18, if a man lies with a woman and there is an emission of semen, they are to both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until evening. And then in evening, they could come back into their tent or, you know, the, the, the man was allowed back into the army encampment. And again, um, there's, a, a, there's a health factor here. There's a, a holiness factor here. And there's, there's also attributing to semen. This is the, the power of, of progeny. So God is handling this very carefully, uh, elevating, if you will, and it's, if you want to call having to be unclean, elevating yourself in status. But basically what he's doing is he's saying, you know, this semen stuff is serious business uh, because it, it is really the man and the woman getting together, the emission of semen, that's the, the start of the family unit. So God wants this uh, treated in a special way so that it gets special attention. And then, uh, but also it keeps the, the, the people healthy, which is good. And verse 12, now I must say 12, 13, and 14, uh, there was a long time where I didn't understand these verses. And when I did, it was just absolutely hilarious. So I love this section. He says in verse 12, you're to have a place outside the camp that you can go out to and relieve yourself. And you and I know what that is. It's to have a bowel movement. So he says, you know, you're not going to poop in the middle of your camp. You got to have a place outside of your camp, your army camp, where you can go out and go to the bathroom. Verse 13, and you must have a digging tool among your equipment. And when you squat down outside to relieve yourself, you are to dig with it and then turn back and cover your excrement. And now God's got to give them a reason why he wants them to do this. Now, he could say, because otherwise you're going to get sick and there's going to be, you know, diarrhea and, and, all, and the possibility of hepatitis. And there's these things called, he, he doesn't go into any of that scientific stuff at all because frankly, they weren't prepared to know it. They, they wouldn't have had a clue what he was talking about. And so God says, okay, you want to you wanna have a place outside your camp and you're going to cover your excrement. And here's why. For Yahweh, your God walks around in the midst of your camp. <laughs> and if you guys are getting the drift of this, God doesn't want to step in your poo. So you're going to go outside the camp and you're going to cover it up. And if you've heard any of the teachings or on God coming down in the form of a man, you know, this is actually the fact that God would say this to them. God walks around in the midst of your camp. That would give them a feeling of safety and security because God is among them to protect them. And that's what he says. God walks around in the midst of your camp to protect you and to defeat your enemies before you. So your camp must be holy so that he does not see any indecent thing among you and turn away from you. If there's a bunch of piles of poo, God's not going to be here. <laughs> it's going to be somewhere else where it's safer to walk. That's the way he presents it. Um, but we, we understand what he's doing with getting this, the, the environment to be healthy. Um, verse 15, do not deliver to his Lord a slave who has escaped from his Lord to you. He is to live with you in the midst of you, in the place that he will choose within one of your gates that pleases him. Do not oppress him. This is an amazing law, and there's no other law like it that anyone is aware of uh, in the ancient Near East, because all over the ancient Near East, the, uh, the pagan nations had, um, had treaties with each other that if a slave from one nation ran to another, 
that the, the nation would return that slave. Of course, in the Roman world, the slave was usually pretty quickly killed um, or tortured to death. Um, but this, this law is unique, and it was one of the laws that set Israel apart, that if there was a slave that was being so badly treated, he, he risked running away from his master and the household that he was connected with, and he made it to Israel, then Israel was to take him in and shelter him and not return him to the nation that abused him. And this is, is really unique and one of the reasons that people felt comfortable coming to Israel in the first place. Verse 17, there are to be no cult prostitutes of the daughters of Israel, nor is there to be a male cult prostitute of the sons of Israel. Um, now, the, the law for prostitutes is actually wider than that. And if you were to read Leviticus 19.29, there weren't to be any prostitutes among the women of Israel. Um, but here, God specifies cult prostitutes because they were used to attract worshipers. You know, if you had a, a temple with a bunch of cult prostitutes, then that was pretty attractive to some people. And so um, it, inter, it intermingled sex with the worship of pagan, pagan worship. And then, of course, you also uh, destroyed the family unit. Prostitution basically destroys the family unit. If the man and wife are having problems, then you make the extra effort to work it out or you get a, a divorce, which was allowed by the law. But, you know, the, although the men were, did visit prostitutes, um, the fact of the matter is you were supposed to respect the, the center, the core of God's society, which was the family. And then verse 18, going back again to law, the law Torah being instruction. Listen to this instruction. You are not to bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of Yahweh your God for any vow, for the two of these are an abomination to Yahweh your God. Um, this is a little confusing because what is the wages of a dog? Well, in this context, because it's juxtaposed with pro, a, a, a prostitute, a cult prostitute particularly, you are not to bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog. The, uh, the word dog became a derogatory term for a man who engaged in homosexual intercourse because they were entered from the back in the same way that dogs hump on each other from the back. So this is not talking about dogs bark bark at all. This is talking about male prostitutes. And the fact that God said, prostitution is abhorrent to me, and I don't need and I don't want any money from that kind of activity. And then if we understand that and understand that this is instruction, then if we kind of, you know, just lean back and calm down and take a sip of coffee and think, we can think of other activities that are abhorrent to God that God doesn't want your money, so to speak. Like, let's say a palm reader, you know, and here's a palm reader and they make a bunch of money uh, reading people reading palms, you know, and you're, you're enlisting demonic forces to find information about people so you can read their palms so you can get that money. God doesn't want that money. And this is an instruction that lets you know there's certain money that God doesn't want certain things you could bring God that he doesn't want. And so he gives us an example of money from prostitution, but then we expand upon that uh, in our minds in other areas. Um, verse 19, you are not to charge interest to your brother, interest on money that you lend, interest on food or interest on anything that can be lent on interest. To a foreigner, you may charge interest, but to your brother, you must not charge interest that Yahweh your God may bless you and all that you put your hand to, to in the land where you are going in to possess it. Now, historically, um, and by the way, this, um, this verse is also one of those verses that's 
also repeated in a slightly different way in Exodus. If you want to scribble down a verse, it's Exodus 22, 25. By the way, I have these verses in the commentary on these different uh, verses. So if you say, gosh, what did John say about all that? <laughs> Go to Deuteronomy 22 and Deuteronomy 23 and read through the commentary and you'll, you'll pick up both the commentary and these verses. But um, so Exodus 22, 25, Leviticus chapter 25, uh, verse 35 to 38 have uh, verses about not charging interest. Now, when it says here, you are not to charge interest to your brother, it's well known among the scholars and even among uh, the ministers who teach this, that this is not talking about you, the, the brother uh, who is in your family, like my brother is Tom, he's the son of my mother and father, just like I am. This is talking about your brother Israelite, your fellow countrymen, the one who is like you. And that becomes very important because uh, in the Middle Ages, the Christian church at that time in the Middle Ages, it, the only church in town was the Roman Catholic Church. So the Pope and the Cardinals decided that based on this verse um, and, and Exodus 22 and Leviticus 25, that Christians should not lend to Christians with interest. That if you're, if you're a Christian and you're lending to a Christian, you just give them the money and let them use it and they give it back. And that's as simple as it is. Well, obviously, by the, by the Middle Ages, there were a lot of wealthy people who were making their, their wealth by lending things at interest. And so they were scrambling. What do we do now? The church just decreed that we can't loan anything out to fellow Christians and get interest for it. What do we do? How do we maintain our income stream? And so what they said is, okay, but you can loan to a foreigner. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up an institution, became a bank. We're going to set up an institution that holds money and lends money. And we're going to take the Jews and we're going to put them in charge. And we're going to, we're going to make them the bankers. And they're going to be in charge of our money. And they're going to make the decisions about who to loan money to and who not to loan money to. So that we don't get involved in those decisions. And then they're going to charge interest to the Christians. And then, and then, and we're, we're going to hire them at wage, but that interest that they charge that then goes back into the bank, that be, that's, that's ours because it was our money. So the interest that comes back becomes our money and we pay the Jews a salary and that's as simple as it is. And so that started in the middle ages and lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we wonder, well, how did the Jews get to be so entwined with the banking? Well, for hundreds of years, they were the only ones allowed to be bankers. And so they were all bankers, and they were all money lenders, and they were all brokers of various kinds. And that's how the Jews got that position, and why the Jews today still, in many cases, are involved with the banking industry. So good history lesson, very interesting. Uh, verse 21, when you vow vow to Yahweh your God, you're not to delay paying it. For Yahweh will God, will God will require, yes, require it of you. And again, here the verb require is doubled uh, in different uh, cases in the Hebrew text for emphasis. So if, uh, and, and it will be counted as a sin to you. So if you, if you say a vow and you can't keep it, or you rather you won't keep it, it's all of a sudden it becomes inconvenient to keep it or whatever, you know, keep it anyway. Um and verse 22 says, if you refrain from vowing, it will not be a sin. It's never a sin not to vow. But if you're going to make a vow, then you keep it. By the way, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and 5 say the same thing here. Um, verse 23, whatever has gone out of your lips, you are to keep, and you are to do as you have vowed to Yahweh your God. It was a voluntary offering that you promised with your mouth. You didn't have to do it. It was a voluntary vow, so keep it. Oh, it's inconvenient now. Keep it anyway. And that's, that's how we shine our light, is people can trust us when we prom make a promise. Verse 24, when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, and again, neighbor here doesn't have to be like your next door neighbor. It's a, a fellow Israelite. When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, then you may eat of grapes 
until your soul is satisfied, but you must not put any in your bag. Verse 25 is similar when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you must not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. So this is mainly designed for traveling people, uh, like the apostles and Jesus were walking through the grain fields. They were hungry. They took a few handfuls of grain. And you can see where a, a farmer might be a little annoyed. You know, uh, if they, you live, if a farmer lived close to a major trade route and lots of people were walking by and they would just kind of wander through his vineyard and, you know, each one would take a couple handfuls of grapes and walk on. Um, you can see where the farmer might get annoyed, but basically what, what God is saying here is that you have to have a level of trust for me that if you're, if, if you are obedient to my word and are concerned about travelers who may not have anything to eat, they may be hungry, and, and you're willing to give up some of your crops, some of your effort to sustain them, to help them, then I, God, will bless you. And that's really the way we've got to be with our stuff and with our money uh, and with our time that we're willing to help others, understanding that God will bless us back. Uh, there's a verse in Proverbs, the one who lends, the one who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. So when you give to the poor, then it's like lending to Yahweh and he will pay his debt back. Absolutely. So these are some of the laws and regulations uh, just in these two chapters in Deuteronomy. And they help us think straight about God and Christ and life so that we can shine as lights. And it's a great reason that we want to be reading the law and remembering these things, because we can also then help fellow members in our society who haven't ever read this or don't know it or don't understand it, and they're living in a way that's contra to the way that God has laid out in his word. So thank you for your attention tonight. It's been a blessing to share this with you. Uh, I, I got super blessed doing the, the work behind it, and I hope you got blessed in the teaching. So God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming.